Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our third part and final part of acute abdominal pain in the ERGI pathology. Now, we left off with this case before. We spoke about chemotherapy and radiation therapy and bone marrow transplant. One thing that we also need to think about is medical therapy. The classic is lisinopril, which is an ACE inhibitor. Patients have not been on lisinopril for months, but literally a day or so. Patient was put on this and they get this severe reaction where they get markedly thickened bowel. Look at the vasorecta. You're looking at this, you're thinking about ischemia, you're thinking about enteritis, and it is enteritis, but it's drug-induced. Look at the small vessels. It almost looks like ischemic bowel. That's how the patient presents with an acute abdomen, and that's what you're thinking about. Look at the vasorecta on these volume rendered and cinematic rendered images. Look at the small vessels we're seeing distally and the inflamed bowel. Wonderful example of changes related to ACE inhibitors. Another example, look at the markedly thickened bowel, the edema, look at that. Again, you can go through your differential of infectious, inflammatory, ischemia, radiation, all of those things you want to think about. There's ascites present as well. Patients presenting with an acute abdomen question, should we go to the OR? But when you get the history, the patient started lisinopril 24 hours earlier. You simply uh, give the patient fluids. You support the patient, stop the medication, and with 20, within 24 hours, the patient is back to normal. So a very, very critical diagnosis. But looking at the images on the right, you can see how similar it is to some of the other things I've discussed with you in the series. So again, the importance of thinking about what the patient is being treated with. Often the clinicians don't think about it. It's your job to at least ask the question in this patient on ACE inhibitors. Another patient, same thing. Look at the thickening of the small bowel. There's ascites present, so uh, changes related to ACE inhibitors can have ascites, thickened bowel, small vessels. And again, you're going through a large differential diagnosis in your mind, but again, ACE inhibitor induced angioedema. So when you think about the thickening of the bowel, it's really angioedema. Uh, angioedema is a clinical description of inflammation mediated edema in the dermis of subcutaneous tissues owing to increased permeability across capillaries. This may involve the skin or respiratory or GI tract, and generally when the medication is stopped, resolves within 24 hours. ACE inhibitors are a leading cause of drug-induced angioedema in the U.S., accounting for up to 40% of all emergency department visits for angioedema. Again, it's important to think about that possibility. Management of patients with symptomatic small bowel angioedema is mainly supportive. In a majority of cases, symptoms usually resolve within 24 to 48 hours of stopping the medication. So again, very, very important. You can see the pattern, mural stratification, straightening of bowel loops, interloop or mesenteric edema, ascites, are all things we think about with many of the pathologies I've described with you today. So it's a great mimicker, but unless you think of the history, you can see why the patient could end up in surgery because of concern for ischemia. The lactate acid will be negative in these patients typically, so that's very important. Now, the last thing I'll just comment on, because some people have asked me to comment on, is GI bleeding. Now, we can talk about GI bleeding in the small bowel or large bowel due to inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, underlying malignancies, chemotherapy or radiation-induced complications, or trauma. We talk about angiodysplasia. It's the abnormal proliferation of venules and capillaries within the submucosal layer of bowel. It's more common in older patients, most common in the right colon, but can be seen in small bowel as well. You see densely opacified or dilated draining veins, early filling of veins, dilated feeding artery, vascular submucosal tufts in the wall of the bowel. Arterial phase imaging is the best phase, but remember when we do bowel, for bleeding, we're doing two phases, so we'll have both. 
Here's a good example of looking at the prominent vessels in the cecum and right colon. This case I show you also to make the point that you really need to go beyond the axials because look on the MIP and volume rendering. Look how nicely that angiodysplasia is seen. The prominent vessels in the bowel, the prominent feeding vessels, very subtle on the axial, but very obvious on the volume rendered and MIP imaging, nicely shown in this example as well. Again, angiodysplasia can occur also in small bowel, but in large bowel most commonly in the right colon and cecum. Now, we talk about dual phase imaging. I mentioned for ischemia, you need dual phase. For a lot of the bowel pathologies, dual phase. And thinking of bleeding, dual phase. Yes, you could probably see a bleed in both arterial and venous phase imaging, but sometimes you'll only see it in venous. Often you'll see the fact that the bleed increases between arterial and venous phase imaging, which means the likelihood is that patient, if they get angiography, the bleeding site will be seen. Here's a nice example of bleeding due to diverticulitis. It was missed initially on the arterial phase imaging, but look how much more obvious it is on the image on your right on venous phase imaging. So sometimes you can see it, but just barely and mainly in retrospect on arterial phase when the venous phase is again so easy. Compare this image to this image. Yes, I think you should have seen it on the arterial, but you ain't going to miss it when you look at the venous. Very nicely shown there. Another case, abdominal pain, GI bleeding. You can see the patient's left colon. There's a bright blush, which is bleeding, and that's due to diverticular disease in most cases. Very nicely shown on the coronal views. You can see it also nicely on the MIP. So again, the point we make, axial coronal 3D imaging, when you're looking for bleed, volume rendering is very good, but thin slab MIPS may be more helpful. You can see it here as well. And then as you go from arterial to venous phase imaging, the bleeding becomes even more impressive, as you can see here at 60 seconds. Our typical uh, injection timing is about 35 seconds arterial and 70 seconds venous. And again, the venous phase imaging just shows the bleed a whole lot better and very nicely shown. Another patient with rectal bleeding, you can see some pneumatosis, something's going on in the rectum. Arterial phase, you see basically nothing. Maybe there's a little bit of fluid in the bowel that's high density. You can see here, that could be a good sign. Sometimes you see high density fluid. This is true in the stomach as well as the colon, but you just don't see the bleeding. Sometimes bleeding stops. We know that from angio. We know that from surgery. But when you see high density, you can say, I see blood, but I don't see an active site of bleeding. So at least that can be somewhat helpful. But here very nicely on the venous phase, look how active the bleed is seen. So again, the point being, we always do dual phase imaging in these cases. And in most cases where I'm worrying about small bowel or large bowel pathology, ranging from ischemia to inflammatory disease to bleeding, dual phase imaging can't be beat. Again, very nicely shown here. And let's stop there. I think we've covered a number of different topics. I am going to put some additional talks together on some of the other things in the acute abdomen from the GI tract, but I did not want to cover all the things because then you have to cover the pancreas, you have to cover the liver and spleen, you have to cover um, the vessels in more detail, and we'll get to all of those in due time. So concluding then, CT is a study of choice in a wide range of small bowel and large bowel pathologies. Think about GI bleeding. Often when you're evaluating the patient, we went through things like radiation changes and graft versus host disease. We went through chemotherapy changes. Often both small bowel and large bowel are involved at the same time. CT is very helpful in detection of disease, classifying disease, and in patient triage. And again, you may have to ask questions about the clinical history. Often the clinical history is limited and we don't have the key facts. And sometimes you just have to ask questions. Hopefully with ChatGPT coming along, we'll ask ChatGP, has the patient had radiation? Are they on any medications? That will be a wonderful thing.
Anyway, I hope these talks helped you, and with that, I wish you a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.